Hello and welcome to Launch Time Politics, reaching you live from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nav center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzoma. Here's what's coming up on the program. Political parties in the state now racing against time to nominate candidates for the governorship election in September. Labour Party APC to make decision today. Edo State Deputy Governor Philip Shaibo explains his victory at the parallel election as party maintains his official candidate remains Aswe Igodalo. And on those citizens bid final farewell to late Governor Rutimia Akeridolu, Vice President Kashim Shatima, APC National German governors and top leaders attend funeral service in the ancient city of Owo. We're coming on air with the latest development from Ondo State, where the ancient city of Hawaii is hosting dignitaries from across the country who are attending the funeral service of the late governor of the state and an indigenous of Owa town, Besar Rotimi Akeridolu, a senior advocate of Nigeria, at the funeral service holding at the Cathedral Church of St. Andrew. Family members, wife and children, citizens of the state, the Vice President Kashim Shatima, Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Senator George Akume, Senate leader, uh, uh, state governors, and there is the state governor and his colleagues from other states, as well as the Senate leader, Akwemi Bamidele, are physically present to pay their last respect. Mr. Rotimi Akredulu died on December the 27, 2023, after a long battle with leukemia. Our thoughts and our prayers are with the Akeridolu family. Let's move on now to other stories. And this is also what's happening right now, where the Labour Party is getting set to pick a governorship candidate for its direct, indirect primary at the party as the party races against shadow time for the exercise by the electoral umpire. About 30 aspirants are hopeful for victory after today's exercise when delegates from the 192 words converge on Bishop Kelly Pastoral Center in Benin City for the election. Lately, the Labour Party has been embroiled in a leadership and preparations crisis leading up to today after its national chairman was arrested as Julius Abure over alleged sundry infractions, but later was released by the police. Now, a similar last-minute exercise is also being conducted by the APC to select who flies the party's flag in September. The APC governorship primary follows an initial controversial outcome from the February 17th exercise chaired by Governor Hopu Zodima, which produced three candidates laying claim to victory. The impasse led to an emergency meeting of the National Working Committee, where it resolved and declared the primary election inconclusive, and afterwards fixed today to conclude the exercise, which will now be chaired, or which is now being chaired by Governor of Cross River State Senator Basio II. At the moment, the visuals you're seeing, uh, the returning officers from the 18 local government areas have presented their results. And it's now a waiting game for all of the party members and the aspirants to see who will be declared winner at the end of today's exercise. Well, it's a different kettle of fish for the PDP. A lawyer and entrepreneur, Aswe Godalo, has emerged winner in the party's governorship primary election. He polled 577 votes to defeat seven other contestants in the primary conducted at the tennis court of the Samuel Obamuda Stadium in Benin City, the Edo State capital. The ticket for the PDP in this year's Edo governorship election is at stake in this primary election holding inside the tennis court of the Samuel Obamuda Stadium in Benin City, the Edo State capital. 585 delegates across the 18 local government areas of Edo State have been accredited for this exercise. Distinguished delegates, this is for you, please. Either you put it straight 
or you put it up. The chairman of the Edo PDP Primary Electoral Committee, Zamfara State Governor, Dauda Lawal, called for fair play among the contestants. What I will call on the aspirants to be low abiding, to understand also that we are going to be fair to everyone. And I believe they understand the rules of engagement. Let Just before there. voting, Your the aspirants have the last opportunity to so vote. While some Kajo delegates for support, Omosede uh, Igbenedion pulls out of the race no, and Dustin Aswe Igodalo, she joins Omorege Ogbedi Ihama, who had earlier sent in his withdrawal letter. I guarantee that all and sundry will be part of my government. Today, I appeal to all my supporters, all the delegates, the leaders, women leaders, youth leaders, people across party lines, in and outside the state, to join me to support Aswin Ugodalo Esquire, to become the next governor of Edo State. Then voting begins in the alphabetical order, starting with Akoko Edo local government area. There will be 31 accredited. 557. 558, 559, 560. At the end of counting, Aswe Igodalo is declared winner after garnering 577 votes. As the Chief Returning Officer of the Edo State 2024 Governatorial Primaries, therefore declared Asurime Igodolo as the winner of just concluded primaries today with a total vote of 577. The PDP flag bearer then takes center stage. He expresses gratitude to the party for entrusting him with the party's governorship ticket. I will work tirelessly for our states. I will assemble a group of young men, women, older, middle-aged, the best hands possible to move our state to the ne next level. And I promise you all that I will give you my all. The Edo governorship election has been slated for September 21, 2024. The People's Democratic Party, PDP, has confirmed its participation in the polls with this primary and their candidate, is Aswe Igodalo. But that's not all from the PDP in Edo State. There has been some backlash from the party primary, uh, which produced Aswe Igodalo, as you saw him declared as a candidate of the party. Now, the deputy governor of the state, Mr. Philip Scheibel, who is also an aspirant during our breakfast, during our breakfast program today, says that he's also been elected but in another delegate election, which held yesterday in Benin City, he faulted the process that led to the election of Mr. Godalo, which held at the Samuel Ogbemudia Stadium in Benin City. Mr. Godalo says he's going to reach out to everybody, perhaps including yourself. So if he does reach out, first of all, has he reached out to you yet? Uh, Chamberlain, you see, democracy is all about inclusion. Democracy is about uh, respect. I, the winner of these primaries, have already sent my team. I'm sure by now they will have reached out. They told me that uh, Igodalo was granting uh, interview. I've sent a message that I want to see him so that he can join me. Uh, I already have the other eight, uh, eight, eight persons. They, we are going to be having a meeting this morning. How they will support me. First, I need to bring on board nice Igodalo. And I've sent a message to him. And I was deep. I got that he was a rice television program that uh, they, will, uh, they cannot reach. Uh, so I am already reaching out to him. Join me so that we work together because I am the authentic candidate. And as we move on, you will realize that. So I want to play a role now of bringing everybody together. The governor remained my senior brother, senior to me with plenty of years, my senior brother and uh, my boss. That is where it is. Well, it's called politics. Let's see how things play out. At the end of the day, who is going to reach out to who between Igodalo and uh, Philip Shaibo? But that's why we're going to have this particular conversation on the outcome of that particular ex exercise. It appears that so far, uh, for the 
leading parties in the state, there has been one controversy or the other, from the APC now to the PDP. Uh, we've been joined uh, by an Edo PDP leader, Mr. Ose Aneni. Mr. Aneni, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thanks for having me, Jeffrey. I think I'm curious to know why you're smiling and laughing. Maybe you respond well from there. <laughs> I, you know, I've taken part in, in elections before, and when you lose, it's one of the most devastating things that can happen to any politician. Um, it, it truly is a heavy psychological blow. Uh, when you come out intending to serve, intending, you know, you have a raft of things you want to deliver to the people, and they choose someone else. Um, so, you know, I understand, I'm very, I understand what uh, my brother Philip is going through. I sympathize with him. Um, but unfortunately, that sort of is, is the nature of, of politics. We had 10 aspirants cleared, uh, but only one person was ever going to emerge as the candidate of the party. Um, you know, we hold the deputy governor in the highest regard. Uh, along with all the other nine aspirants, any one of them was more than competent and capable to rule and lead Edo State. Um, but, you know, the delegates, you know, it's, it's democracy and the delegates have decided to go in our direction. Um, you know, and, and so I thought of, uh, I was listening to his interview and I sort of was, was uh, amused that, you know, some of the claims he was making um, about, you know, the fact that he emerged from a primary process, you know, I, I, and, you know, you're asking simple things, you know, if we start from the position, Jeffrey, that it is only the end of the UC that is giving the legal authority to organize and conduct primaries and congresses, um, who organized the event he, ha he held in his um, house in GRA yesterday? Um, who ratified the delegates that he claims voted for him? Who ratified the venue? Who ratified uh, anything that happened? Um, who was his returning officer? The NWC, as you saw, had designated the governor Zamfara as a returning officer for our primary process, has stated that not only was the venue going to be the Ogbe Stadium, it was going to be specifically the lawn tennis courts at the Ogbe Stadium, had ratified and published the list of 594 delegates. And, you know, so when I see my, my brother, uh, the deputy governor, um, doing what he's doing, uh, I understand why he's doing it. But what we are going to do as... as um, uh, Tim Aswell Godalo is, you know, my candidate is not gloating. He realizes that we need everybody, we need a united PDP who are going to be successful at the September 2024 um, um, governorship right. elections. And so we truly are reaching out. We have reached out to Philip and we will continue to reach out to him. We need him on board. He truly is a powerful political figure in the state and, and by no means are we going to come on here and dismiss him. All right, let, let, let's, let's find out from you, Mr. Neni. Uh, it appears what, part of the agitation of the other nine, because as soon as the process started, they started agitating, literally almost immediately. Uh, does this mean that they perceive that there has been a predetermination of Aswe Godalo to emerge as a party candidate, despite whatever effort they put in, uh, the biases of the top leadership from the governor as well as other people? Governor has denied that he's not backing him, but uh, people are having the feelings that um, well, it's a political statement, but he has a right to say what he has to say. So it, it appears that it's been predetermined. That's why they came to, you know, fight back. Is that the way you are going to characterize the situation that led up to this moment? No, I, I think what it was was that a lot of people underestimated Barsaswe Gudalo. We've been on the campaign trail for this primary, primary contest for about six months now. We've been to every local government area. We've seen all the stakeholders. We've seen all the leaders. We've been in markets and schools. We've met everybody. And I and I, I remember one time I was we were in Benin City and we got a call uh, to meet a leader in in Irua. And we all jumped in the car at 9 p.m. and drove breakneck all the way to Irua to catch a meeting. And we only came back to Benin at about 4 a.m. It was that type of you know work ethic I think that led to the point where. When these other aspirants started indicating an interest to contest, they found that most of the delegates and most of the leaders had already committed to um, Barisaswe Igodalo. He's a very, very compelling figure. His vision for prosperity for those State is one that few people can 
can knock. And, and, I, and I, so I, I think that was, that was the problem. So it, it wasn't that uh, it was predetermined. It was that, you know, we understood on a fundamental level that politics is local. The smallest unit in the political party structure is the world. And so we were approaching world leaders and world executives and world delegates. I remember, for instance, I called a meeting of um, my world executive, 55 of them, um, just after the Christmas. And we endorsed Barrister Aswe Egbedalu. So nobody was ever going to come to Asia North East to campaign because we were already pledged to go one way. Um, and, and I think, you know, maybe they underestimated him. You, you, you must have heard some of the Sobi case they were referring uh, to him with. Uh, they underestimated him and they found out by the time the concert actually started, um, Edo State PDP uh, had pledged itself to Vision. All right, let, 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 let's talk about going forward now. Two, two questions, but I'm going to take one, uh, one after the other. The homeboy factor, uh, because I can see Philip Shabu, deputy governor, constantly saying, I'm, an ho I'm, a, I'm a homeboy. And um, uh, people are even criticizing Saswe Godalo that I think he's went, you may have to correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that he went to his village uh, or his community and he couldn't speak his own dialect to his people. How will someone like that? be able to lead the people he can communicate with. So this is why the issue of homeboy and the issue of Edo Central becomes like a political tool to vie for uh, opportunity. So how much would that play out in terms of going forward with this exercise? Again, I, I, it's, I'll just repeat myself. I think people underestimated um, you know, so when you call yourself, you know, you come on channels, television, and you call yourself a homeboy. But when your world delegates come out to vote, they vote for uh, the person that you, you call an outsider or a stranger. You know, delegate votes, again, the words, the words are the smallest unit of the political structure. And so if you are a homeboy, one would assume that you would win the home vote, you would win the delegate vote. And we did the hard work. Uh, most of the other candidates didn't. Maybe they felt uh, there would be the usual anointing or, or whatever, but we didn't depend on that. We didn't rest on our oars or laurels. We just kept on working and working and working, even up to the week leading up um, to the, to the uh, primaries itself. We kept on calling and communicating with delegates and reaching out to them and just setting a vision. Um, there was never any sense of triumphalism right. or, or um, a feeling that this was going to be a fait accompli. All right, um, all right, all right, Mr. So if you can answer this in just uh, 30 seconds, I'm, I understand I'm totally out of time. So reaching out should be the next option. Uh, uh, when you look at politics, Aswe Godalo is a political neophyte uh, by the definition of who a politician is. It's, it's coming from the private sector. So sometimes the dynamics of this thing can be quite tricky. How much of reaching out is he going to do to make sure that he gathers as much, uh, you know, support from the people that are aggrieved as possible? Um, that's, I think that's part of the misconception a lot of people have. And Dr. Aswe has been involved with Edo State in 2008. He worked with um, Adal Oshomole. He worked with Governor Basaki, lending policy advice. Um, and so they underestimated him. They thought he was a neophyte. And so... Um, going to his professional background, he's a boardroom chairman. And one of the things you, you need to do in boardrooms is find compromise and negotiate. So he has the skills required you know, to succeed within the political space. And we will continue to um, negotiate. I do have to commend Omosede Ibenijan for what she did. It was brave of her. And we truly, truly appreciate uh, the right. gesture. And we expect right. we'll be able to bring it on board. My sincere apology, totally out of time, Mr. Osa and any Edo PDP leader. Thank you so much and wish you the very best. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. All right, absolutely. Uh, 24 hours after, let's move on to other things now, from, away from politics to security. Now, just about hours after confirming the killing of a notorious bandit, Kingpin, but there is here, called security operatives, they are carrying out a mop up operation uh, in Bada and Rewara, look, general areas of Chiku and Igabi local government areas of Kaduna State. The military on Wednesday. Engage the bandits and his group, taking out the leader, Boderi Shiaku. His elimination therefore comes as a culmination of a tireless effort by the dedicated troops committed to restoring peace and security in the northwest region.
Let's now switch chief gears to security as well as the north, especially the northwest and the north central, essentially, is concerned. We're being joined on the program in our Abuja studio by Tessa Ugbo, member House of Reps, representing Kwande Ushongo Federal Constituency. Mr. Ugbo, thank you so much for coming on the program and thank you for your patience. Ms. Ogbo, can you hear me? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I can hear you. Well, we're, we're, one of the concerns, uh, when we look at the, the volatility in the economy and some of the things happening in the economy, one of the big references that economies and others refer to is the level of insecurity across the country. And Benue State, for instance, which is the food basket of the country, has been affected by you know, insecurity. Why do you think uh, we're not getting as much peace as possible? Are we avoiding certain brutal honesty or there are factors we haven't looked at? Well, uh, thanks for having me once again. Uh, unfortunately, my constituency, uh, Kwando Shongo, is one of the, the constituencies that is greatly affected by this uh, insecurity. And uh, we've tried to analyze uh, and to understand where this problem and where these challenges are coming from. And um, we, 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 know we can only conclude one of two things. It's either this is an economic war, this is a fight for survival, this is a, a fight for land and water. Um, this is a fight for, to grab uh, land and water for the purpose of grazing of cattle, and, and then, of course, for the purpose of farming for our people, for our indigenous people who, who have lived on this land, who have buried their great-grandfathers, on this land for, for hundreds of years. And it's unfortunate that uh, we have a situation where uh, our people are being attacked, our people are being uh, dominated by uh, headsmen who have migrated from, um, from the Sahel region, from the northern part of the country down to the north central. And Benue State having the, the kind of lush vegetation that we have and the water uh, from the river Benue, um, and of course other parts of the north central uh, are taking the greatest brunt of these attacks and these um, this, 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 uh, conflicts by the headers on our people. So, you know, why this is, uh, for, for us, it, the issue of Benue State is not just for Benue people, it's also about national interest because the instability and insecurity in Benue is affecting uh, food security across the country. What efforts are you seeing uh, by governments at the federal and the state level being made to see how we can give closure to these things? Well, re uh, recently the, there was a policy announcement by the vice president um, to set up uh, a scheme called uh, uh, the Puluka or something like that. Uh, it's similar to the Ruga idea that was proposed under the former administration. Obviously in Benue State we're not too happy about this policy. Uh, we believe that any policy that seeks to address the farmer header crisis must first of all take cognizance of the situation of the farmers in Benue State. The, the policy must first look at the situation of the IDPs who have been displaced from their farmlands and from their homes for, for well over 10 years now. And then so if, if a policy uh, is, it seems to be one-sided, if a policy seems to look only at the plight of the herders themselves and not the plight of the farmers who are the greatest victims of this crisis, then the Bene people will not accept um, this policy. Now, we are not against the federal government finding solutions for cattle rearing, for, for, for ranching, and for our Fulani um, uh, 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 citizens in the country. As a matter of fact, I'm the, of the opinion that over the years, Nigeria has focused on agriculture, on farming, so there's been the Fadama project one and two. There's been a lot of incentive for farmers, but there's really been a, a very little uh, support and uh, incentive to cattle rearing, um, you know, to the Fulani uh, cattle rare, rare, you know, rearers and their way of life. So, uh, so I'm in total support that government should come up with policies that improves uh, cattle rearing, animal husbandry, ranching in the country, and help to migrate. Uh, the people who are predominantly involved in this uh, cattle rearing to a more practical, a more formal uh, system of, of animal husbandry and ranching. Um, as long as that is done, then there will be no need for the, for the migration. Migration, by the way, which I personally believe from my own studies and understanding, is caused by several factors, by, by climate change, um, you know, caused by the desertification and the, the, you know, across the northern part of the country, 
And then, of course, the violence uh, over the years from Boko Haram and the rest of it has pushed uh, cattle rearers to migrate southwards. And Benue State and the North Central happens to be uh, the gateway, you know, the bridge between the North and the South. And thereby, we take the majority of the brunt. And uh, of recent, we've noticed uh, that these, these migrants have actually come to stay. So now it's not uh, about uh, uh, clashes and conflicts, but now they've come. They have, they're displacing more communities. And, and now we've noticed that they've come with their families. So they've come with families, with children. And so they've come to stay. So it is, it is about our land. They want the land. They, they want the water. And until the federal government and, of course, the state government takes proactive steps to right. stop the migration of headsmen of, of Fulani down to the southern part of the country, this problem will never stop. I must thank you, Mr. Tessa Ugbo, Member House of Representatives, representing Kwande Ushongo Federal Constituency from Benue State. Thank you so much for your insight on this particular issue. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And at the very beginning of the program, we did tell you that uh, the former understate governor, now later, Rotimi Akerdulu, uh, is being laid to rest. Those are the live visuals from that particular service where uh, the funeral service holding Vice President Kashim Setima, the SGF Senator George Akume, former and present state governors, members of the national and state assemblies, as well as friends and families, especially his immediate families and indigents of all, are here to pay their last respect. Now that he's alive, that he has gone to the great world beyond, we believe that we should never forget him for what he stood for. So I thoughts and our prayers how they occur to the family thank you so much for watching i'm jeffrey ozama